This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A-L-T-I-Z-E-N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Grace Cheng, where she will give an overview of the telcos across Asia Pacific and how they are evolving their business models from beyond being dumb pipes in their respective regions. Hi, Grace. Happy New Year. Hi, Bernard. How are you? Happy New Year. Well, I've been good. And what have you been up to? Well, time has flown past very quickly. It's six months since I left the Straits time. And in between then, which is July and now and, and December, I had a book to finish. And in between, I went on four reporting trips. I was in Japan, Bhutan, San Francisco in Australia. All these stories were for Tech Gundu, which is a Singapore-based tech blog. And then I had a book to finish. And the book is called Intelligent Island, Singapore's Untold Tech Journey. I selected various topics like master planning, which Singapore is famous for, the role of industry and professional groupings in Singapore, uh, digital highway, entrepreneurship and manpower development. These were topics that highlight the defining moments of a Singapore's tech journey. The idea was to get behind the policy making to understand what policy makers and people were thinking about when they came out, drew up all the policies and developmental plans for Singapore. So as we speak, the book is being printed. I'm so happy. It's finally gone off. And it'll be available through the Singapore IT Federation website, which is sitf.org.sg later this month. Oh, so you'll be out in the bookstores as well? It's not sold, but I think it'll be sold through the SITF platform. And so get go, go there and... Uh, it will, it will be ready for sale. There are 2,000 copies, so I can tell you that 1,000 copies are already spoken for, so there's only 1,000 copies left. Sure, I'll probably pick up a copy because I think... You get one, you get one. Oh, sure, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I wanted to get you on because I think you and I have been monitoring what is going on in the Asia-Pacific region, something about telcos, or sometimes people call it dump pipes. Okay, Yep. I think it's easier because telcos have a very big role to play across Asia and because of that, most of these big nations are usually mobile first. So they are part and bit of the whole supply chain. So maybe, can you give a quick background into the telco business moving from telephone to data carriage? What are the, I mean, some people call them dump pipes. So how did they come about? Well, just a bit of history then. Telcos began life offering fixed line telephony, right, through copper cables. Most, all of them were government owned and the profits came from fixed line calls, especially long distance. I don't know whether you can remember those days if you want to call, even Malaysia, for example, it will be very expensive. So long distance was only meant for companies, for businesses. But in the 1990s, there was a major revolution, a telecom liberalization was the movement at that time as governments aimed to offer better services through competition. So the incumbents had to give up their monopoly rights and this happened throughout the world. The first challenge then to incumbents who, who were, who were co- first corporatized and then privatized and many became public listed companies. The first, their first challenge in the 1990s was mobile communications. Governments gave out mobile licenses, the auction spectrum. Mobile communication was, uptake was slow because it was expensive to buy handsets. But they found greater momentum after 2007, after the iPhone arrived and revolutionized the mobile industry. But then new challenges have emerged. The iPhone showed that you can get onto the internet very quickly from a handheld device from a phone. So with the global spread of internet and the arrival of fiber cables, which can carry both voice and data and mobile phones can tap into all of that, the old fashioned telephony has been overtaken by mobile data traffic. So some data points, for example, according to Cisco in February last year, global mobile traffic grew 74% and that is in 2015. In 2016, this rate of growth is much higher. Now, Research House Ovum said media and, media and video was less than 10% of traffic in 2010. But in 2015, it took up almost 50% of all traffic. So if you, take, if you go look at telephones 
in 2015 in developing countries, so Singapore, Australia, Japan, US, fixed telephony in homes declined to 565 million down from 593 million in 2014. So every year, like you knock off 20, 30, 40 million homes, people just got rid of, of their fixed lines at home. So the revenue of international calls, which is the lifeblood of telcos, have declined dramatically. This business has been disrupted by the internet. What happens to the telco? So you naturally have to find new revenue channels and they cannot survive by just being dump pipes. So what is dump pipe? Dump pipe means that they cannot offer basic connectivity anymore. The primary differentiator for these telco players is that they have to offer value-added services. You know, they, it's, it, they just can't compete anymore on just price. That is how telcos have evolved. And today, you have the emergence of what you call over-the-top services or OTT. So this is not only video. People think that OTT is video, but then there are, there are also voice and other services like voice. You have Skype, video, you have YouTube, Amazon Prime, which is uh, being released globally. You have messaging services like Snapchat and WhatsApp. So all of these is a loss in revenue for telcos because they ride on top of the network as a type of value-added services and they don't pay the telcos anything and telcos get nothing. So they actually carry dump pipes. And so they have to be proactive to go out and look for things that they can do to generate interesting and useful services that customers will be happy to pay for. So this is where we are at now. I think you give a pretty good introduction about what the actual traditional business models for telcos. Can you dive a little bit deeper into that and tell me how has that evolved over time? Because given that they move upstream to, for example, to OTT services, do they also rely on other business models to make them themselves stay relevant? So the OTT is like content carriage, right? So they're carrying a lot of content. And you see this happening in the US. AT&T buying Time Warner, for example. Comcast take over NBC Universal. Verizon Communications buying Huffington Post and Yahoo. And it's a win-win for both companies, the telcos and the content companies, because telcos are looking for high-value content that they can offer as a service to their customers. And for the content companies, they are looking for distribution channels to reach larger audiences. But this is not all, right? So other telcos like Telstra and NTT, which have both fixed and mobile as well as internet services, they are all expanding into enterprise business solutions. So they have this network. And of course, with the network, they also have cloud services because they need to hold, store, compute their activities, their connectivity activities. So they offer things like discovery, uh, disaster recovery, cloud services, value-added solutions and applications in industries like education and health. They also support SMEs to develop solutions. And today, the current buzzword around the world is smart cities. All the telcos are looking into how they can use their networks and connectivity infrastructure to tackle key urban challenges like transportation and the aging population. So we can look at some of these local or foreign telcos as they go into uh, these areas. So one interesting aspect of the telco business is the infrastructure. In order to have this kind of connectivity, you need to build the pipes or the fibers and everything else. So with the smart city, does that mean that they have to put additional investment into the infrastructure then? The additional investment will likely come from people. They need the people to develop the infrastructure to educate people how to use the new applications and generally, you have to teach people how to use technology. I give you an example. If you're going to have driverless cars, will the man in the street be comfortable about sitting in a car that has no driver? Will I get into an accident? Where's my confidence level? You know. So I think governments and public sector agencies will have to do a lot in creating confidence levels and education among the people. So these are the two things that you, you need. You need talent for people to develop 
the applications and, and you need the government involvement as well. The infrastructure is already there. I think if you look at Asia, it's one of the most connected with undersea fiber optic cables to east and west coast of uh, the US as well as to Europe. So I think in infrastructure, we are well connected. Of course, in developing countries, you need to put in more there. If we talk about the mobile phone revolution, it did start off more from Europe and Asia. Before the iPhone came out, of course, because the US was doing 2G. And only after the iPhone turned up, data became prevalent. And I think that's the period where the 3G took off and subsequently the 4G LTE networks also take off at the same time. Can you just give a quick overview of telcos in Asia and how have they changed over these years? Of course, the, what people are all looking at and where their attention is focused, uh, companies at least, is China, right? That's where the action is. But I think in 2015, the government's not quite, the peers of the Chinese government wants more things to happen in the telco space. So they overhauled the industry to raise efficiency. In October 2015, the three major wireless carriers, so you have China Mobile, China Unicom, and China Telecom, they transferred their infrastructure, their network assets, means their towers and all their infrastructure, which is worth 35 billion US dollars into a new company called China Tower Corporation. So all of them now have stake in China Tower Corporation. They are just operating companies. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have any backhaul lines for the smaller companies. This is a great way of doing this. Yeah? So building one network is cheaper than building two, three or 10 networks, right? So I think the policy makers around the world are awakening to this fact. So competition is great where it works, but building duplicate networks is very expensive. So for China Unicom and China Telecom, which are smaller players compared to China Mobile, it means that they can now tap on China Tower Company to expand their network coverage uh, much quicker. So if you look at China Mobile, uh, China Mobile is the world's largest phone carrier listed on both the uh, NYSE as well as the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And it, has, it dominates the Chinese market, 60% market share. It also has the world's largest 4G network with 300 million 4G customers. Total customers, that means including 3G, 820 million customers. Can you just imagine they use mobile data usage is 2,760 petabytes just in 2015, you know, and this is an increase of 143% over the pre previous year, and it's enormous. So we know where the Chinese market is going, and data traffic is obviously the major revenue driver. But China Mobile, like other full-service telcos like AT&T, for example, or NT&T, they also focus on the enterprise business, which is corporate customers, and development of digital services. So they sell to corporate customers, government, medical, transportation, but they are very early stage of development in digital services. So digital services like mobile payment, self-branded set-top box, high def internet, video on demand, IoT connections. So I think that they are just at the starting stage and I think that this will grow very quickly. China Unicom is the fourth largest telco in China. It started as wireless paging, also listed on NYSC and the Hong Kong Exchange. But it became a legard. It didn't expand as quickly, especially in 4G. So as a result, uh, it has lost its high-end customers and it's got some ways to catch up. Moving over to India, I think Airtel India is the largest provider of mobile telephony and also second largest provider of fixed, fixed telephony. It provides broadband and subscription TV. Founded in 1995, so it is a, a company that has been in telco for a long time. It's entrenched. But I think in recent months, the Indian market has become very highly competitive. There's another new telco called Reliance Jio, offering free 4G data until March 31st this year, as well as free calls. Uh, and this is it. But the biggest advantage for Airtel is still nationwide 4G. So the market is still playing out and we don't quite know where this is going to go yet. 
Over in Japan, SoftBank, of course, is the biggest. We all know SoftBank because it's promised to spend to invest US $50 billion in the US. Founded in 1981, so it's 35 years old. And guess what? It started live as a distributor of software and publisher of PC magazines. It also acquired Ziff Davis Publishing Company, which publishes the very, you know, very famous PC Week. But in the mid-1990s, it pivoted to become an internet company. I think the founder, Masos Yoshi Son, saw the potential of internet. It established Yahoo Japan through JV with Yahoo. In 2000, it entered the telecom business and it bought some of its competitors in Japan. And in 2013, it bought Sprint and entered the US market. SoftBank has global ambitions. So if you look at its internet-related investments, it is really worldwide. It invested in Yahoo, Alibaba, Supercell, OY, which is a company in Finland. It invested in Tokopedia, which is an online marketplace in Indonesia, Grab Taxi, a ride-hailing service in Singapore, India's Snapdeal, which is an online shopping site. It invested in South Korea's Kopang, which is an online discounted deal site. And it's now beginning to get a foothold into the U.S. by investing in social finance or what is known in the U.S. as SoFi, which is a a prominent student loan refinancing mortgages and personal loans. But I think in 2016 and 2017, SoftBank is going to be focused on rebuilding Sprint and and it really wants to challenge AT&T and Verizon. So, and, and the founder, Masayoshi San, who was supposed to step down when he, when he was 60 years old in February this year, and Nikesh Arora was supposed to take over. However, he decided that the information industry is at the cusp of global transformation. He himself wants to play a major role. He says that he has still many things that he wants to achieve. So we'll still see him around for the next uh, five to 10 years. Probably Masayoshi Sun is the titan of for one of the Asia giants. I mean, SoftBank's reach is probably very far. They also have their Pepper robots. And I think that they have tried to make a play for T-Mobile in the US before and they couldn't get it. So with the new Trump administration, maybe they get a shot to consolidate to be the third largest. Yes, I think that SoftBank of all the Asian companies will likely have a better shot. I mean, the Chinese companies going into US or the rest of the world will always carry some political baggage. But SoftBank from its history it has less of a political baggage. So it's political, it's a global ambitions, I think, are more acceptable. But in, Tokyo, in, in Korea, in SK Telecom, Korea, you know, uh, in the early 2000s was the top broadband country in the world. I mean, if you remember, they were the early ones with a virtual community called SciWorld, and that was SK Telecom. But it was too early, and now, you know, SciWorld has declined. I mean, if SciWorld had appeared today with VR and AR that we know today, it would have I think, exploded. SK Telecom is a mobile carrier, but its sales are falling because of loss of profit handheld sales, especially the discontinued sale of the Galaxy Note 7. In Japan, Entity Docomo, I I forgot to mention that uh, Entity Docomo in Japan is also a a large player and is, of course, SoftBank's uh, competitor, but also with a very deep heritage since it is part of Japan's biggest telco group called NTT. The NTT Docomo was in the early days when GSM was not global. It had its own uh, standard and it was offering its own uh, internet services through a service known as iMode. Um, But I think in the 2000s, mid-2000s, it has all consolidated onto the new GSM platform. But it is now offering new mobile uh, services by collaborating with external partners in social issues like health, medical care, education, learning, and agriculture. So the the aim for new businesses in 2020 is advanced machine translation. And of course, with Olympics in 2020, they want to see increased use of uh, ICT in, in sports. So in Malaysia, DG is Malaysia's leading mobile operator. It's number two with 12 million customers. But actually between the first and the second player, Maxis is number one, DG is number two. The difference is very, very negligible. 
So for example, Maxis is 12.1 million customers with 28.8% market share. DG is number two with 12 million customers and a 28.5% market share. Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, which is the regulatory body, has reallocated spectrum. And I think this will intensify competition, as, which means that DG and other mobile operators will gain access uh, to, to a more uh, efficient spectrum. It means that Maxis has to give back spectrum that they currently own, which is quite interesting, right? And uh, new spectrum that DG will get will, will allow them to compete better. But the, another player that needs to be closely watched is Telecom Malaysia, which re-entered the mobile market in 2014. So they were the incumbent. They left the mobile market for nearly 10 years. And then in 2014, it decided that you know it would come back. But it acquired a local Malaysian operator known as Packet One Networks. And then it rolled out its 4G LTE services in 2016. So this is a company with deep pockets, existing customer base of over 3 million, reputable brand, top of mind recall. So it's going to be a heavy hitter. So the question is, can the smaller companies like DG and Cellcom survive? In the rest of Asia, what is happening here? There was a 2016 survey by Australian telco Testra, Telstra on digital transformation. So this is a, a global survey which was undertaken by tech research in Asia. And it covered England, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, Philippines. And they found that almost three quarters of the respondents acknowledged that they will acknowledge the arrival of this digital transformation, that they'll be exposed to digital, to disruptive forces. So. They know they have to face this disruption. They have to innovate to stay relevant. And they also need to have a more dynamic and flexible tech platforms in order to respond better to customers. So the three technologies this survey identified was cloud big data, analytics, and security. They will have an impact on, on companies who want to provide stronger customer engagement and support. So how do telcos uh, play in this new game then? So they already have the infrastructure. So on top of this infrastructure, they would need additional technologies and capabilities. So enterprise mobility and security uh, is one area. Private cloud, hybrid cloud, data storage and management, supply chain, data centers, software-defined networks, uh, Internet of Things, and other vertical applications. I think this has all been talked about, I think, but in Asia, this is now suddenly coming to the forefront of the telcos. So we see telcos not only as the companies that provide connectivity for us, but also as companies that can provide services for businesses. And of course, just to add on, for Southeast Asia, we have Telcom Cell. And also in Singapore, we have Singtel. I think you have done a very good episode with a lot of US interest looking into the region because Singtel owns a lot of telcos indirectly through shareholding. And I guess one question I have is, is it the, whatever is happening in the US, is it the same in Asia? It is the same. And I think if you look at the Telstra survey, it speaks for all telcos. So if you just look at Telstra itself, its total income is 27.1 billion Aussie dollars, which is 19, almost 20 billion US dollars. It has 58 data centers, 400,000 kilometers of underwater cables. It's got 2,000 points of presence globally. It is also in media because it's a joint owner of the largest pay TV service in Australia called Foxtel. So what, it, what has it done in order to get into this new era of digital transformation uh, and digital services? So it bought PacNet, which was a company that was founded in Singapore and then later bought by other investors. So PacNet has international connectivity, managed services and data centers in Asia Pacific region. So now Telstra has this infrastructure in Asia. It also has a JV with Telecom Indonesia called Telcom Telstra. And in China, also another JV known as Telstra PBS. So in all of these JVs, what it has done is it has followed its customers from Australia out into the region. And in the process, they have also picked up new customers because of its network infrastructure 
in the region. So it is, what is it doing? So it is offering network applications and services like managed network services, cloud, unified communications. It has gone vertical, for example, into healthcare, which is one of its major pillar, delivers telemedicine, radiology, pathology, all of this in Australia. And it will be looking to take this out into the region. Then with, with the explosion in cloud, so it acquired a company actually called Cloud, K-L-O-U-D, which supplies solutions for companies uh, and you, companies use them for productivity, identity, security, application development. The global enterprise services, which is, covers all of this, their income increased 2015-2016 by 11.5%. So I think this is a growing, growing area. So we talk about how content carriage is one way of increasing business revenue. Expansion into enterprise businesses is another way to increase revenue. So in Telstra's case, you're beginning to see this. It also has a media product portfolio, in, uh, which is not only Foxtel, but they also show sports, movies, TV shows. And it is also a carriage for other companies like Netflix and Apple Music. So I think that Telstra is really big. Equally large is Singtel. Its, its revenue is ending March of 2016. Its revenue was over a US $11 billion, slightly smaller than Telstra. But its reach is just as wide, just as big because of its associates throughout Southeast Asia, India and Africa. So its footprint is really large with you know over 600,000 customers. But it, what he has done is it has moved from being incumbent telco with fixed line and moved into mobile. Now it is into mobile data, cloud and cybersecurity. The group enterprise itself is a 4.4 billion USD billion dollar uh, business, you know, about a third of Singtel's uh, total revenue. So it is moving into data, cloud cybersecurity and it's it's uh, the other important pillar is uh, smart cities. Singtel is well positioned because it also has NCS which is uh, a strong ICT player which has been involved in computerization projects since 1981 when it was founded. It was founded as part of Singapore's National Computer Board and its aim was then to computerize public sector agencies and ministries so and it serves a very wide market so it, it understands what government needs and then in 1997 it was sold to Singtel so all its knowledge about how to computerize big enterprises and agencies went to Singtel and I think this will serve it well so I think if you take computing and communications and put the two together I think Singtel is, is, is well placed so one of the major areas that they'll be very good at will be smart cities. First thing is they've already won at Singapore's congestion road pricing, the next uh, new one. And it has combined with Mitsubishi heavy industries using advanced satellite technology. And this new system will be in place in 2020. In healthcare, NCS and Singtel uh, provides this continuous care management, which allows doctors and caregivers to remotely engage with patients. Uh, don't forget, Singtel also has its pay TV arm called Mio Services. It also has the music streaming services. And lately, it has started its own e-commerce platform, one of which is the digital newsstand, it's selling New York Times, Wall Street Journal. And now for Christmas, it has put its own products where people can buy its products and services as gifts for their loved ones. Then they want to know that if this is not enough to fill their pipes with content and services, they also hedge their bets with, by starting a subsidiary called Hook, H-O-O-Q, which is a Singtel, Sony Pictures and Warner Brothers company joint venture, which began in 2015, first launched in the Philippines and has now expanded to Thailand, India and Indonesia. So it is, uh, this is really what you call uh, East meets West or West meets East because it shows movies and TV shows from Hollywood to Bollywood. So it's starting to produce original content now. So I think Singtel bears watching. So in, in this part of the world, I think that Telstra and Singtel 
are the ones that are regionalizing, internationalizing very rapidly. The other telcos in the other countries are less so. I, one of the major reasons could be that Australia is a developed, sophisticated market. It has combed its market quite well, so now Telstra is moving out. Singtel, the market here is obviously very small, therefore it has to internationalize. For other markets like the Philippines, Indonesia and other countries, their networks have not really tilted down to the ground, so their real focus is to ensure that, for example, 4G services is available countrywide. So if you look at PLDT, Philippines Long Distance Telco, it is an 88-year-old company, you know. And recently, it changed its name, it, PLDT Long Distance Telephone Company. It smacks of uh, legacy and traditional business and dump pipes, right? So it called itself PLDT now. And its focus going forward is on digital services, transforming itself digitally and trying to make headway into the enterprise solutions space. So for the first six months, for the first nine months of 2016, it didn't do very well, simply because there is their old, the previous CEO had left, the current chairman has taken over, a new CEO will only be found the next year. And so, you know, but the infrastructure are well, the, the framework for growth is being put into place now where the first step is rebranding itself as PLDT. Then there was a management reshuffle where their businesses, all their businesses, mobile and enterprise were put under one person. So I think you begin to see that they are, are moving forward. So they have uh, two verticals called PLDT Alpha and PLDT SME, which offers IT services, uh, data center, cloud, big data, managed IT and security as well uh, to businesses, as well as to SMEs. So they're building beyond telco services. And I think PLDT is representative of some of the, uh, of many of the telcos in the developing countries in this part of the world. Looking at these trends, where do you see their next steps for 2017 then? For example, Telstra and Singtel are taking the battle regional and new emerging markets such as Myanmar are now appearing. Do you see them pushing towards the niche verticals such as healthcare or expanding more into other regions that may produce much more quick wins for them then? I think in 2017, telcos will need to create, discover and deliver services that people actually value. So content carriage will become more important. Telstra in Australia, for example, has just secured a six-year multi-million dollar deal to bring women's tennis to a global audience. Beginning this year, tennis fans will be able to see whether it's Serena Williams or the rising stars like Muguruza play women's tennis association events around the world. And not only one event at a time, they can broadcast multiple simultaneous live feeds from concurrent WTA tournaments. So I think tennis fans can see more tennis than in previous years. This is one way where they can make their pipes more useful. So the question is, will other telcos follow Telstra's strategy? So will Asia see, for example, an AT&T Time Warner deal where Telco buys a content company. The opportunity is here. You know, the news media business, like everywhere else in the world, is going through tough times with advertising revenue taking a big plunge. So will 2017 see a big Telco company partnering a content and a traditional newspaper company? I think that'll be exciting and interesting to watch. But I think also it is the enterprise business that Telcos will see growth this year. We can expect to see richer offerings in cloud services, IoT, M2M, and in more vertical industries such as health and education. So let's take the current buzzword today, for example, in smart cities or in the case of Singapore, smart nation. All the telcos are looking into how they can use their connectivity infrastructure to tackle key urban challenges like transportation and the aging population. So business solutions, especially like the IoT services, that can measure, for example, the frequency of traffic of cars passing along a certain road. I think all of this will start to appear. The another area I think that will grow for, for telcos is cybersecurity. Telcos are the only companies where they have customers in whether you're a consumer or a business, they have customers in these areas. 
And with mobile computing on the rise, telcos are in a good position to offer security services from end to end and extend the services into the enterprise. I think a big market is the SME market. The challenge here for SMEs is how to break into the SME market. So looking towards the future, all the key telcos like Telstra and Singtel are preparing for 5G. Telstra and Singtel are already testing. Other telcos are beginning to test 5G services. So I think that it is all going to be very exciting. For me, personally, 2017 will turn out to be an exciting year to write about the telco industry. Wow. So I think this conversation is not going to end here. Thank you, Grace, for giving such an interesting overview of the telcos in Asia and also whether the Asia telcos are really dumb pipes. I think there is some form of an answer in our conversation today. So help my audience. How do they find you? Well, you can find me at LinkedIn and Medium. Just type in Grace Chung. Also at Facebook, type Intelligent Island and I will be there. Cool. You can find me at blongcw at bernalong.com. Subscribe to us at Analyze Asia, A-N-A-L-Y-S-E Asia. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, TuneIn, and also Google Play in the US market. And of course, tweet to me, recommend us on Overcast, and even give me a five-star rating if possible on iTunes. And of course, Grace, once again, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Bernard.